Tonight, we're in the northeast, one of the key battlegrounds in the general election. Our venue is the Aberdeen International School, a symbol of the prosperity oil and gas has brought to this city. But will that continue in the move to renewable energy? Let's find out. Welcome to Debate Night. Two weeks tomorrow, the nation goes to the polls. Here tonight, looking for your votes from the Scottish Conservatives. Remember, no MPs at the moment as we're in the election period. So former MP and Minister for Nuclear and Renewables, Andrew Bowie. Before entering politics, Andrew served as an officer in the Royal Navy and is standing again in the forthcoming election. From the SNP, Richard Thompson, previously a co-leader for Aberdeenshire Council. Richard was elected to Westminster five years ago and hopes to return again in two weeks' time. The Scottish Labour MSP for North East Scotland is Michael Mara, elected three years ago. Michael is the party spokesperson for finance and is in charge of Labour's policy platform for the Holyrood elections in 2026. Also with us tonight, the former party leader of the Scottish Liberal Democrats, Willie Rennie. Willie is MSP for North East Fife and the party spokesperson on economy, education and communities. And finally, from the Alaba party, Kenny McCaskill, an SNP member for over four decades. Kenny was previously an SNP MP and switched to Alaba three years ago and he's standing again for the party on the 4th of July and just a reminder of course during the election campaign you're here tonight to speak on behalf of your parties and not about constituencies please welcome them all to debate night And of course, welcome to our studio audience here in Aberdeen. It's great to be back with you. And you can join in the discussion from home, wherever you are in Scotland right now. BBC DN is the hashtag you need on social media. And our Debate Night podcast is available for you to download straight after the show. So let's get started. Our first question of the night comes from Deborah Cable. Deborah, evening. Can the panel please clarify how they intend to transition into renewable energy without the unemployment of oil industry workers? Thank you, Deborah. Uh, Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce say the next UK government has 100 days to restore confidence and save 100,000 jobs. Michael Mara. Well, we've got a plan as uh, the Labour Party across the UK to make sure that we can make that transition. It's not easy. Uh, it's not been easy anywhere in the world when we've had these big energy or technological transitions. And there are difficult choices to be made in that process. And that would but start on the 4th of July, because you say no new licences after that. It, That's the cliff edge. It, well, it has to start. It won't be a cliff edge. We're absolutely clear about that. And we're committed that there will not be a cliff edge. And I know it's a real concern to people in Aberdeen, Aberdeenshire and across the country. It's incredibly important to our economy. So it will mean turning on GB Energy, a national generating company that will co-invest with private companies to build these, to build these, uh, these uh, it, I, I can't say where it'll be headquartered, but it will be headquartered in Scotland. So I, I'm not able to reveal that tonight, but it will be headquartered in Scotland, which I think is a, a great uh, promise for Scotland for the, the years to come. We know how important Aberdeen in the North East is to this. Uh, it's to going this to be transition. Aberdeen, isn't it? Where else would you put it's, it? <laughs> it's, uh, there's a very strong case for Aberdeen, a very strong case for Aberdeen, I have to say, and I can see members of the audience nodding, nodding on that basis. But we do need a reasonable, rational plan. We need to make sure that we do that for the long term. We have to make sure that we can actually support the oil and gas industry because there will be a need for oil and gas for decades to come as we try to make that transition happen. But we have to accelerate that transition as much as we can. And that is a challenge, and we are, it's one we have to rise to. OK, man in the pink top, in the back row. Uh, yeah, can we hear what GB Energy actually is? Because we keep hearing different stories. I heard you say generating there. I've heard the leader of your party say it won't generate energy. What's going on? What is GB Energy? Mm. So, so it is a generating company, that's, that's the, the intent, or will be when we have the chance to set it up, and we'll be putting forward the legislation to establish that um, in, at the very start of the next parliament, should we have the opportunity to serve. It will also co-invest with the private sector to scale up existing technologies, so we'll have projects with them, and, and also to generate new technologies and put those in place. So I think it's a game changer, for, uh, for not just for Scotland, but for the whole of the UK. And it's the kind of intervention that the government has to make to make sure that we can actually get a stake in this game as citizens, that we should be actually benefiting from the profits of energy generation rather than just handing this away. Okay. So we, there, there's a, a big win for us in that. And uh, that's also about getting bills down because we have to make sure we get some of those returns so we can stop the pressure right. on we, households. We, we, we might come on to that in a second. Lady in the green jacket there, second row. In terms of you, you're talking about the location of GB Energy, it wouldn't, it, in terms of that location, 
being all the specialist skills are here already, it would be the logical place to have it. Otherwise, what's going to happen is you're going to have a mass exodus of specialist skilled workers mm -hmm. leaving the city and the surrounding area, leaving this area far poorer than it has ever been. It makes no sense to move outside of this area. OK, thank you. And gentlemen with the beard. Yes, mm -hmm. on you go. So, <clears throat> you say that we're going to need oil and gas for decades to come, and we will. That's just an inescapable truth. So why are your party trying to tax the industry into oblivion? Right, OK, let, let me pick up that point in a second, but let me bring Richard Thompson in first on, on this as well. How do you intend to transition into renewable energy without costing jobs here in Aberdeen and around the area? Well, we have to recognise that it is a transition. Now, Michael is right to this extent. We're going to need oil and gas for decades to come as both fuel and as feedstock. But uh, my concern from what I've heard tonight is I don't think there is clarity amongst Labour spokespeople about what GB Energy is or where it will be based. But also, they want to increase, in order to capitalise it, They've got rid of their only recognisable policy uh, of uh, investing £28 billion annually in that uh, because they were worried about the, the attacks that were coming at them politically from the Conservatives. Completely untrue. But all, well, it's completely true. Completely untrue. Well, totally unaffordable. Sort it out between yourselves, guys. But well, they want to do it by increasing the, the windfall tax in the North Sea. Now, capital is mobile, capital is fickle, and that is why Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce have warned about 100,000 job losses. So I think licences, if we're issuing them, all they do is slow the rate of decline, but they should be done on an evidence-based... Right, let's... Uh, an evidence -based no, no, hang, hang on that point. Yeah, licenses, if we issue them, is the presumption from the SNP for or against new licenses the in the North The Sea? presumption is for if it can pass the climate compatibility checkpoints that we've been arguing for, that the UK government was in support of and seems to have gone quite quiet on. So can so, Bo pass the climate compatibility test? Rosebank passed the climate compatibility test. So what would fail a climate compatibility test? Uh, if the carbon intensity was greater than... That, that, that equivalence elsewhere and if we were uh, in a position where we were not importing. There's just two aspects of that. So you need to, there's two aspects to this equation. We need to continue to be an, a hydrocarbons producer, but we also need to be investing heavily in renewables in that opportunity. And I think the UK government has let the North East down badly. It's failed to give the green light to the ACON project that's been that have carbon capture in Peterhead. They sat in their hands for the best part of a decade and a half. They have not matched the Scottish government's commitment to the, the, the renewable energy fund for the North East of Scotland. And we need to see government stepping in and filling in the gap. And I've not heard anything from Labour at any point in this campaign and Labour will be the next UK government, there's no doubt of that. I've not heard anything that will boost renewables to the extent right. it needs. Right, and Michael, will I, I will let you come back in, but I want to hear from the audience it's because it's their jobs we're talking about. Lady on the front row. Um, you say that Labour has not got clarity for, for transition, but you are delaying the publication of your energy strategy from your manifesto until after the election. Yeah. Uh, what is in there that we you don't want us to know? Okay, Scottish let, government let, let, hang on a second, hang on a second. Like, I want to hear more people There's in the audience. In. Man in the front row, on you go. So Labour are saying no more new oil and gas licences, yet we're going to need oil and gas for decades to come. Will that not just result in us importing, importing more oil and gas from overseas? Okay. Yes. All right. Uh, Andrew Bowie. Mm -hmm. Well, the answer to that question is yes, it will, of course, which is why uh, we legislated just a few months ago as the UK government for annual licences in the North Sea. Look, transition is incredibly important. I'm very proud to have served in the Department for Energy Security and Net Zero. You know, we're leading the world when it comes to offshore wind. We've got the first to fifth largest offshore wind farms in the world generating power right now. We're the first country in the G20 to have our carbon emissions. And we're leading the world when it comes to not using uh, unabated coal for power generation. But to do all of this, to fund the transition, to fund the investment in new technologies, we're going to need a profitable uh, energy generating uh, oil and gas sector in the North Sea Bruce right now. Sunak says you're going to take every last drop out of the North Sea. We're right. going to maximise economic recovery. That's good not <coughs> just for our energy security, not just good for the wider economy, but good for jobs here not good for the in planet. the North East of Scotland. It's, of course it's good for the planet because we're, the, the money that's being generated... <laughs> well, who do, uh, uh, this is a quote that was used by Dave Whitehouse of OEUK. Who do people think is going to invest in the new technologies of the future? It's not the chocolate industry, it's the existing energy industry. And if they're not making a profit here in the UK, as Richard Thompson says, capital is, is mobile, it will move to other parts of the world. We need to have a, a, a profit-making, job-generating, energy-generating industry based here in the north-east of Scotland so they can invest in the new technologies that are going to move us towards net zero moving forward. All right, gen but, gentlemen with the beard. 
Actually, the politician should be, all politicians should be actually honest and come in one point, work actually honestly, what they talk and what they do should be actually link. And then the politician actually raise the tax and then all company are actually closing because of the tax. Okay, thank you. And gentlemen on the same row as you. Yes, on you go. Yeah, I mean, the UK only produces 0.8% of global production of oil and gas. So even if we turn off all the taps tomorrow, it's going to make little or no difference to climate change. I agree that we have to uh, reduce our consumption of oil and gas uh, as much as possible by, uh, by converting to renewable, but there's no point in decimating uh, the jobs in the northeast and the uh, uh, and all of the skills and all of the the economic benefit that it brings to this country and this part of are you, uh, are you worried it's happening too fast it, i just think it's not been it doesn't seem to have been thought about it's it's the, it's let's stop oil now let's let's move to renewables we need to keep oil going as long as possible and get as much money as we can out of it to fund what the change and that is my huge concern with labor's plans for the north sea because they would not only extend the windfall tax, they would remove the capital allowances and they would say no to any oil and gas licenses moving forward. Now, what international oil company is going to look at the North Sea and think that's an investable proposition if that is the mood music that's emanating from the government of this country? I'll tell you, none of them. Okay, okay. So that's why it's All such right. a damaging plan okay, for the North okay. Sea. Kenny McCaskill. Well, some countries discover oil and make the desert bloom. We're in danger of Scotland discovering oil and seeing an industrial desert created, not simply in the northeast, but across all of Scotland. Nobody denies that we have to have a transition. It's not just the loss of our summer here. Uh, that's bad enough, but it's like nothing in comparison to the record heat hitting India and the developing world. So we do have to transition. But it's how do we get there? And we do have to have oil because we have to have oil for plastics, for turbines. We have to have oil to be able to get the ships and the vehicles that will get these turbines and other renewable sector there. It has to you know, be a just transition. We have to protect the skills. We have to protect our core industry. And that is not happening. What's the time scale for that, Kenny? Well, I think that has to be worked at. It depends how quickly you can ramp up at the same time as you look at doing the alternative. But at the present moment, what we have to do is to maximise the capacity that we have and ensure what we've got. We're in danger of being the only major oil-producing nation without a refinery capacity. In the top 25 oil-producing nations, only Scotland will be a country that doesn't have a refinery capacity, will be akin to the likes of the Republic of Congo or indeed Trinidad and Tobago who produce less. What will be seen is that they will take our oil, it will be taken in tankers abroad, it will then be sent back to us and we'll pay a premium for the purchase of it at the, pipe, for at the pumps or in our houses. That is ridiculous. We are an energy rich nation. We require to ensure that we don't have the absurdity and perversity that we actually have fuel poverty in our country. One third of our people are in third, uh, fuel poverty. A quarter of our pensioners are in extreme fuel, fuel poverty. We require to use oil and the bounty that's coming of renewables to get revenue for our country, to get jobs for our people, to have businesses locating here, and to be able to have cheap, affordable fuel because it's perverse that people in this country can see turbines turning on and off their shore and can't put on their heating. Thanks very much. Let me hear from the lady in the back row. Yes, on you go. We're always talking about generating more green energy. But how about the politicians and all of us step, take a step back and say, how about we first reduce mm -hmm. our energy consumption and then we try and meet that new reduced target with, with green energy. And as an energy manager, I can tell you right now, there's no renewable or green source that can meet our current demand. But if we cut it down first, then we can do something more about going towards green and net zero. Uh, and the man in the white jacket in front of you. How, as a Conservative, can you sit and say you are proud of working on net zero after the government has promised to scrap their net zero targets for being afraid of Nigel Farage? We haven't said we're scrapping any net zero target. Net zero by 2050 remains our what was policy. It before it was 2050? We've halved our carbon emissions, the first in the G20 to do so. What We've was got it before 2050? The fifth largest offshore wind farms in the world. We've got a target of 70 gigawatts of solar by 2035 and investing in new technologies like tidal around the country. I'm very proud of what we've achieved uh, in terms of our march towards net zero as a country and as a Conservative government. But we're not going to do that without the uh, revenue being generated by the existing oil and gas industry uh, based here in the northeast of Scotland, which is why investing in its future is so very important. Okay, okay. Uh, Willie Rennie. So, so the lady at the back was absolutely spot on. 
This is about reducing our reliance on oil and gas by reducing demand. And that's partly through insulation programmes, which we are way behind on. But secondly, we need to transform our heating systems in our homes and also the transportation system, which is still too heavily reliant on oil and gas. Now, that should be the rate determining step on all of this. Mm -hmm. The chest beating, I have to say, on licenses is really depressing. I would rather there was much more focus on issues like how do we get the people with the right skills to work in the renewable sector? How do we build the infrastructure to get that energy and that electricity transported across the country? How do we make sure that we've got the supply chain? Because people, I can tell you, in Methyl, in Fife, are looking out to the wind turbines mm -hmm. in the fourth, and not one of them was built by the yards in Fife. They're having to pay extra in their energy bills, but they're not getting any of the benefit of it. But we also need to make sure that we have the investment in the infrastructure and the supply chain, and all of that requires investment, and that needs confidence. So we need to stop chopping and changing on the policy on energy. We need consistency so we can get the investment in to make all this so happen. So when, when, when Labour say no. in, in two weeks' time, no new licences after the 4th of July, are they wrong? I, I don't agree with that particular approach. I think we need to have a much more pragmatic approach and look at the individual licences to see what we require. Because there is a danger if you cut off all the licences that the whole system collapses because it's all integrated. But what we need to be doing is putting much more focus on the renewable energy, reducing demand, so we can make sure we get the climate change obligations met, rather than all the chest beating on oil licensing. Kenny McCaskill? Well, what we have to do is to ensure that licensing transitions us into what we need to do, not just to protect our environment, but to protect our economy. And what we have to do is to tie in new licences with carbon capture, which is essential to try and ensure that we protect our planet, but also with the production of hydrogen. And that should actually create a virtuous circle. We have hydrogen buses here, for example, in Aberdeen, and they're used elsewhere. We actually have a manufacturer down in Falkirk in Alexander Dennis that makes electric and hydrogen buses. 100% of UK's green hydrogen is going to be produced here in Scotland. Scotland. Why don't we make sure that not only do we provide hydrogen so that we have cheap, affordable bus services for people, especially in rural areas, but we have the high-skilled technology that manufactures these hydrogen buses? Uh, the danger is that the most recent order from the UK from Transport for London has seen the order for buses, uh, hydrogen buses, go to China, not to come to Alexander okay. Dennis, not right. even to go to Ballymena or indeed all to right. Yorkshire. J just briefly, Michael Mara, when Willie Rennie says this is a cliff edge, this is too fast, what's happening here with Labour, is he right? No, I don't, I don't think he is right. And, but this is challenging. We have to make sure that we don't present a cliff edge. I don't believe that's what we're doing. We're working with the industry as closely as we well, can. The 4th we'll of July we'll is the cliff no, edge. No, it's absolutely not. We will have a need for oil and gas in this country for years to come. And if I, I can say, Stephen, there's lots of issues raised about Labour's policy on this right across the audience tonight, and, and rightly so. We have to continue having those discussions. But many of the issues raised, things like insulating houses, things like investment in refinery capacity, mm -hmm. things like carbon capture and storage, these are all part of Labour's plan. But it has to be paid for. And part of that is about the windfall tax. And we've heard from the SNP in recent days a completely rewriting of their policy. What they want is the full 28 billion of a commitment, plus <coughs> they want to scrap the windfall tax in its in entirety. That is 37 billion pounds of uncosted, with no completely unaffordable commitments. They're just selling you a load of rubbish. <coughs> they don't have a plan. They don't have an idea, and they're making it up as they go along. And people should, when they make the choice on the 4th of July, it's about a plan. Yes, it's challenging, but it's actually written down, and we can work through it with the communities okay. together, and we can deliver on okay, it. OK, OK. Your views on everything you hear in the programme, the hashtag is BBCDN. Tonight, we're in Aberdeen. Next week, we're going to be in uh, Edinburgh for our final show before the general election. The week after that, we will be uh, off because of the election. And the week after that, we're going to be in Glasgow. So if you'd like to be in the audience for any of those shows, just jump onto the website. It is bbc.co.uk forward slash debate night. Let's go to our second question of the night, which comes from Sophie MacDonald. Sophie, good evening. So besides more money, what else is it going to take to get our NHS back on its feet? Thank you, Sophie. Uh, SNP manifesto out today calls for an additional 1.6 billion to be spent on the NHS. Richard Thompson, is it all about the money? Uh, money is certainly a very big part of it, and I think nobody could fail to look at the manifestos of the Labour Party or the Conservative Party 
with anything other than alarm at the, uh, the £18 billion fiscal contraction that there is going to be over the period of the next Parliament if either of them stick to the fiscal rules that are there. Look, we know that the NHS right across these aisles has uh, a power of work that needs to be done to build back better after the pandemic. Now, in Scotland, we have more GPs per head of population. We pay our NHS workers more. Uh, we get that commitment. We've got the commitment so to public services. So why are we not services. doing better? You've, you're spending more than ever before. You've got more staff than ever before, but the results are going down. Uh, well, productivity product, is going down in the NHS. Productivity is not going down. The number of operations has gone up by 3%. So it's heading in the right direction, but not quickly enough. So money is a big part of it, because if you don't resource it adequately, you'll get commensurate outcomes. But the other thing I think we need to do is we've effectively cut off a labour supply through ending freedom of movement of uh, all sorts of people who used to come here from Europe who worked in our NHS. If you saw somebody from overseas in our NHS, the chances are they weren't a patient, they were actually working there delivering the services. So we have uh, through Brexit, through ending freedom of movement, we have collectively cut off our noses to spite our face. So to fix so it's the about NHS, we need to get back into Europe, is what you're saying? Uh, we, can, we, need, we need to have access to the biggest pool of talent we have. So it's about the resources. Part of that is the financial resourcing, which is determined in large part from the UK level, as even West Streeting Labour's health, would be health <laughs> secretary says. But it's also about the human resources, all right, all right, investing right, okay. properly in that and making sure we have enough people Hold to do the job we need to Sophie, do. Sophie, you asked the question. I've got a hand up. Sophie, what do you want to say? Um, so I actually have the privilege of working in the NHS and I think we can talk about, until the cows come home, um, um, Richard, about um, this is what I should, think we should do. The SNP have been in government yes, for 17 absolutely. years. Absolutely. What have you done? Yes. Um, sorry, that's my initial question. Um, the other thing is you talk about spending, but the morale is low. I can't remember what exact phrase was you said, oh, something is better, like operations are down. The morale in the NHS workforce is low. Um, and what I want to hear from everyone is an actual plan for like workforce planning. Um, you know, we talk a lot about doctors and nurses. Um, I'm, I'm something, um, I'm a medical associate professional. This is a new, a new idea. You know, we don't, all the problems of the past. What do we need to do in the future? We need to change the way we're thinking. Mm -hmm. We need to think about our ageing population. We need to think about, um, you know, I work in a sphere where we're trying to stop people getting admitted to hospital because we talk about, you know, there's so many people. So we need to be thinking differently. But, you know, I... Yeah, if you think about something new and fresh. We, we, we hear you. Pay dispute's still going on south of the border, but not in oh, Scotland. Sure. Something new and fresh is what she's asking for, Richard. Well, I think the, the lady makes an excellent point about workforce planning. I think... Uh, we also have to recognise that demand has changed. It used to be that patients would see their GP on average of three times a year. Now it's six times. So there's a huge increase in demand there. And perhaps we need to look at, well, we do need to look at things, concepts like realistic medicine, which uh, improves quality of life without necessarily prolonging life. So I agree, you need to have that whole system approach. And I think that, uh, you know, we, we need to be making sure that we get the care aspect of that right because acute hospitals are not always the most appropriate setting for people sometimes that's uh, people can be cared for better at home they can be re-enabled but well I'm, I'm concerned about you know the care bed situation and again that's something that can only be resolved with an increase in human resource and an increase in okay, financial so something resource. the SNP are not prepared to look at is uh, the private sector but this is a key part of Labour's plans to try and sort out the NHS Michael Mara. So we definitely have to make sure that we can make use of capacity wherever we can find it. There's no doubt about that. And we're absolutely clear that's free at the point of use, people being able to access the NHS as they do and getting the operations where they're crowned. So we have one in six people in Scotland on waiting lists. There won't be anybody, in, I think, in this audience who doesn't know somebody who is waiting for a, an operation. And we'll have a situation where we have people in Scotland who are now remortgaging their houses in order to get chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. or to get a hip replacement. It's appalling. Now, on workforce planning, it's like some kind of fever dream for the, for the SNP government. I mean, this is, they've known about demographic change for a generation and done nothing about it. And if I can come briefly to money, because I know the question is about reform. What we've heard in the SNP manifesto today is that we're going to increase taxes across the UK and then redistribute that money to Scotland. That's the tax increase. The Institute for Fiscal Studies have said tonight that they don't even understand the fiscal framework, how any of that works. There won't be a fiscal benefit for Scotland from the proposals the, that are in the SNP manifesto. If the it UK government followed the tax policies that's been followed by the Scottish government here, there would be an extra £16 billion 
for to, to, to spend, and that would be barnetised. That's how the fiscal framework does work, I, Michael. I'm, I'm sorry I'm, to I'm say. I'm afraid, Richard, it's not. It really you is. Really Michael, don't you don't understand. To, really don't understand how it works. If you think it's, you have the block grant adjustment, and that's laid off against the amount of money that's spent. It's you do not understand. Never, how never mind this works. the SNP's plans. What about Labour's plans? Is this about money, or is this about reform to change the NHS? So it has to be about both. What we've said is we have far too many national bodies and bodies of 50 different institutions running the health service across Scotland. We can both save money and actually make a streamlined decision process much cleaner through that. We can cut bureaucracy. We're also clear that what we want to do is close the uh, tax loopholes for non-DOMs, get that money into the system and make sure that we can actually get more operations in Scotland to cut those massive waiting lists that have come under the SNP. OK, let me hear from the audience. Lady in the straight top. Yes. You went straight to talking about the waiting list, which is where this debate always goes, but you've ignored the question which the previous woman asked about morale. I'm currently a fourth year medical student and will be a qualified doctor in two years. How can you promise me that I'm going into a system that will not only support my patients, but also support me working in it, mm -hmm. instead of me, like so many others of my colleagues who are already thinking about leaving to Australia and New Zealand, where we will have a better system to work in and therefore have the energy and the confidence to care for our patients like the care they deserve. <laughs> Fourth year student, you'll have seen quite a lot already. Is it what you expected it to be, the NHS? No. The, the people working in it, I can tell you that I'm a medical student at the University of Aberdeen and the support I get from the tutors and the doctors is amazing. But they are working in a system that is against them. They're working in a system that isn't supportive of the patients or them. And quite frankly, I'm already scared <clears throat> for the two years that I have left before I'm a qualified doctor. Crikey. OK, thank you. Gentleman on the aisle down here. Yes, on you go. Yeah. The um, health service is a devolved um, service across all nations, and we're talking about 18 years. 18 years that should have been dedicated to planning and support. And now we're here on debate night, you know, listening to excuses and not actions. Because what guarantee do we have that next time we won't be talking about the same problem over and over again. I have friends, I have family members who work in the NHS and they are frustrated. What do you have to say to them? Andrew Bowie. <clears throat> yeah, you're right, so uh, NHS and healthcare is uh, devolved uh, to the Scottish government. It has been since uh, devolution came into existence in 1999. And I think, frankly, people across Scotland are sick fed up of hearing Scottish government representatives and SNP candidates across the country telling them that they should be grateful uh, for the service that they are getting. They should be grateful that the waiting lists uh, are not as long as they are uh, in other parts of the UK. They should be grateful they don't have to wait as long to see a GP. And they should be grateful that NHS staff are actually paid more, uh, if that is indeed the case, uh, than in other parts of the UK. What they want to hear is what the SNP government in Edinburgh, who are fully responsible for the health service in Scotland, are going to do for the health system's future. In Aberdeen, we've got uh, a fantastic hospital filled with brilliant staff. We've got buildings that have been planned for nigh on a decade still under construction. We've got an <coughs> NHS Grampian board that is uh, millions of pounds in the red. And did you know there's only one part of the UK where the health budget is actually being cut as opposed to being increased? And that's in Scotland as a result of decisions of the Scottish Government in, West, uh, in, in Holyrood. So they need to stand up and take ownership of the fact that they've had control of the NHS in Scotland since the day they came into power in 2007 and people in Scotland think that things have gotten worse and that is as a result of decisions taken by the SNP Well the Edinburgh. SNP say if you gave them more money the situation would be improved here. It's but your yeah, choice not to do that. The, the, the block grant actually is, a, is at its highest level ever. The Scottish Government have got tax raising powers hence why everybody uh, in Scotland earning over £28,000 <coughs> is actually paying more in tax than they would do if they were south of the border and by the way that is also having an impact because we are struggling to recruit GPs into Scotland and one of the things that putting off GPs moving, uh, taking their families and working well, Brexit's uh, here in Scotland been a factor in that, is, uh, is, 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 a, is, is the fact that they'll be paying more in tax than they would if they worked anywhere else in the UK. I'm also, by the way, frankly, fed up of this idea that freedom of movement is somehow going to be the solution to all of our ills. There was only one country in the United Kingdom that even though we were in the EU and had freedom of movement, had a, a declining population. Guess what? It was Scotland. As a result of the decisions taken by the SNP government in Edinburgh, it's time that they owned up and started taking you know, ownership okay. of some of the decisions that there they've taken. There are some people in the audience who look like they're about to burst, and given that we're discussing the NHS, we'd better not have that. Man in the striped shirt here. Yes, on you go. Check shirt. 
Uh, yeah, so we've all agreed that the NHS is uh, a, a devolved issue across the UK. So whether it's the SNP in Scotland, the Conservatives in England, Labour in Wales, the NHS as a state, no matter which part of the UK you're in, is it not about time that parties started to work together rather than against each other to tackle this as an issue, as a whole, a UK-wide issue? Thank you. Uh, and lady right in the middle there, yes. Hi, so I have a family member who um, has got Parkinson's. He was told that it would be a 70-week wait to see someone with the NHS, so has had to go private. Yeah. And I, I can say, working for NHS as well, that it's devastating for a family member to have that. And actually, Brexit, I worked with so many different people from so many different cultures, coming, wanting to work for the NHS. What has Brexit brought to the NHS? What has been the benefit of Brexit for NHS? Because I can't see it, and neither because my family member. Well, what, do, what do you think needs to happen? Is it about money or is it about reorganisation, reform and change? It's about allowing freedom of movement of people that wanted to come into this country and work for the NHS. Thank you. Man in the green T-shirt just in front of you. Yeah. Thanks, Stephen. Um, I'm probably going to be a bit bombastic here, but it just feels like no one in the panel has any radical thoughts about this at all. If you go back to the concept of the NHS and the <laughs> radicalism that was happening there um, post-war, maybe look to that and, you know, try and think a bit differently. And, 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 yeah, I don't know. All right, well, that's the second person in the audience <laughs> to ask for fresh ideas and fresh thinking about this. Willie Rennie. So I spent far too much of my days in hospital over the last two years with close family members. And I saw close at hand what the young lady sees every single day. It is demoralised. They are despairing. It is clogged up. The system doesn't move. Ambulances wait outside for an age. Now, from what I can see, there are two areas that we need to focus on. Practical, pragmatic things we need to change. And one is social care. We have not been paying our social care workers enough for far too long and we've taken them for granted and now they're walking. They get paid more working in a supermarket yeah. than they get paid caring for elderly people. That needs to change. That's why we need to have a two pound uplift at least for social How's care How's that gonna workers. help hospital waiting lists? Because that means you get a flow through the hospital. You can get people out of the hospital back into their home. Well, it's not gonna speed it, up operations. No, no, it does required. because people are waiting for operations because they can't get beds in the hospital. The whole system is clogged up from one end to the other. So that's the first thing it needs to change. The second thing it needs to change is mental health. The mental health of this country has deteriorated significantly <laughs> in the last few years and it is putting huge demand on the service, including on police services as well. We need to make sure we invest in more mental health to release the pressure on GPs as well as secondary care. If we can do that, those two single things alone would put, relieve a huge amount of pressure. But we keep looking at a &E waiting times, which is the wrong end of the system to measure. We should be measuring the back end to make sure that people get the right care. We can do the preventative stuff, we can keep people at home, we can deal with their mental health, and if we do all of that, I hope the young lady at the back will feel more upbeat about the NHS. She'll feel more proud that it's a place that she can work. And if we can do that, we might be on the road to get an NHS that we can be proud of. All right, let's hear more from the audience, your experiences of the NHS, and maybe some of these ideas, these <coughs> fresh ideas. Man on the end, yeah. I don't have an experience, but my, my comment was, why, is finances, why are finances so stringent when it comes to funding the NHS? But a magical pot appears when it's funding a proxy war halfway across the world. And a uh, lady with the glasses and the big earrings, yes. My question is um, regarding the Conservative manifesto. So what are the implications for NHS funding of a cut in national insurance? How, are you, how is that going to impact on NHS funding? Andrew Bowie? Well, there'll be no cut to NHS funding, indeed. Very proud that in the uh, 14 years of Conservative government at a UK <coughs> level, uh, the NHS budget has increased every single year, now at record levels, which is, some, which is why we need to look at where that money is being spent and what the NHS is actually doing to support those people who are working in it. But we are spending now record levels of money uh, on the NHS, and now we need to see how we can improve the outcomes within the National Health Service and how we actually make that money work You're better. You're still getting... Sorry. Yeah, on you go. No, on you go. Sorry, how is that possible, though, that you're not going to reduce funding when you're going to reduce national insurance? How is that possible? It, like, what, 
how are you going to make that work? So what, what you, you're going to have less money, yeah. so, uh, so how are you going to find the money you need for the NHS? Well, we're, we are growing the economy, and we will be... Uh, <laughs> and we are also... Just and we will also be cutting... Just down the we were, we were also be cutting down. Why, why well, are you unlike, there laughing? Uh, well, uh, well, well, unlike anybody else in the panel, the Conservative Party and I actually believe that the people best placed to spend the money are the people who are earning the money, and that's why the government should be taking less of that, which is why we're committed to cutting taxes. We've cut, You've cut 900 pounds. It's just that we've cut 900 pounds. Uh, if everybody shouts at once, nobody is listening. Finish your point, Andrew. We've cut £900 in national insurance this year alone, and we want to go further with that. But there will be no cut in NHS budget. We have said that the NHS budget, budget is protected. Indeed, in every year of Conservative government, it has increased, and now it's at record levels, and we're very proud of that. OK, my, uh, Michael Marrow, I'll come back to you in a second. Kenny McCaskill. Well, I think <coughs> the gentleman in the green T-shirt was right. The NHS is fundamental to who we are as a society. Uh, Post-45, it has made that social democratic consensus like many in the audience, I was born in it, my parents died in its loving embrace and my family has been treated by it. What we cannot afford to have is some US trade deal like bringing in Kentucky Fried Medicine or indeed Wes Streeting undermining it, hollowing it out through privatisation. That doesn't mean that it's all about the money. Money is important and we haven't been investing and that's why, you know, when you choose to wage war then you do miss out on other aspects of society. But there are other fundamental matters. It is about morale. Some of that relates to wages. A lot of it's white, far wider than that. Mm. We are losing people abroad, so it's wider than that. And we do have to ch consider changes. The whole role that Sophie operates is something that we have to look at because our society is changing. What remains fundamental is what sort of society you want. And the society I wish to seek is a society that has the NHS at its heart and it isn't undermined by privatisation. The SNP... Um... <laughs> SNP said today they're going to introduce legal protection for the NHS uh, moving forward. Uh, that suggestion that Labour, the, the, the door will be opened by Labour to American healthcare providers to move in and privatisation will follow. What do you say to that? I mean, it's, it's utter drivel. I mean, well, the, 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 tell, it's completely <laughs> untrue. The SNP's position on this is that it, actually devolution is the protection for the NHS in Scotland. There is nobody in the Scottish Parliament that's saying that it should be, it should be privatised. I sit there, you know, three days a week and speak to... There's nobody saying it. All It's just in totally a gimmick. I think the lady's point, though, about unfunded tax cuts or unfunded tax cut promises from the Conservatives is really well made. Tens of billions of pounds. They've got no idea how they're going to fund it. You know, it's pie in the sky, it's rubbish. And we, to say that we're growing the economy, Andrew, is simply untrue. We've got, the, no, lowest, no, that, that we've got the lowest level of growth no. in the G7. We, our That's economy has stagnated. This parliament that has just ended, people are poorer at the end of it than they were at the beginning, which has never happened in British history before. The economic record of this government is appalling. Mm. We desperately need growth in order to actually put money into our services. But you don't get that with the Conservative government. All right. well, okay, we okay. are growing actually fast than uh, uh, other Briefly. G7 nations. We're fa growing faster than Germany and we're growing faster than France. And just today, inflation was announced that it came down to 2%, which will signal uh, further right. growth okay. Uh, okay. to the economy. Okay. Okay. So we are we need to say is There's a lot else we want to try and get through this evening. The hashtag is BBCDN on social media for you to get involved in the debate from home. Our third question of the night comes from Keith Littlejohn. Keith, good evening. Uh, uh, does the opinion of independent supporters matter less to less to Westminster than those who want to remain in the Union. Ooh, Keith, what do you think? I think a recent poll showed that 51% of Scotland supported independence, but the main leaders have said they don't support it. How have they just ruled out half the population? Kenny McCaskill, your uh, manifesto comes out next week, and uh, Alex Salmond says that it will contain the only serious plan for devolution. Give us a headline from it. Well, at the end of the day, independence is necessary, because I was saying earlier, we are an energy-rich country and a fuel-poor people. It's utterly perverse that we're in that situation. So how do you deliver but, it? Well, I think you have, what you have to do when the referendum is ruled out, then every election has to become a de facto referendum. And that is why every vote for a, an independent-supporting party should be viewed as a mandate for independence. That's what and the SNP a, say. Uh, no, they're not. They're seeking to ask for a Section 30 order and to ask Sir Keir Starmer uh, to give them that. What we are saying is that the the election is the 
trigger a point for independence and a vote for independence will be delivered that way. But the gentleman is quite right because they have been treating independent supporters with contempt and indeed with disdain. The comment about protest and terrorism and all the aspects where those who support independence are classified along with others who are waging war or undermining civil society is simply wrong and disrespectful. That is, I say, the position taken by Sunak. Those who have supported independence in Scotland have done so peacefully, democratically, and yet they have been treated with utter contempt. And that will continue by a Labour government as it has been imposed by a Tory government. And that is why the Scottish people have to use the election as an opportunity to say, enough, we want independence. Michael Mara. So I don't support independence. I'm not in favour of another referendum, but I fully understand why many people do, because they've had two dreadful governments for the last 17 years that have actually let them down badly. And I have to say, if I was an independent supporter, I think I would feel very badly let down by the SNP over recent years as well, because the behaviour of their party has put independence in a place where it is, frankly, it's, it's not any kind of viable means of pursuing it, but their conduct has actually undermined it. So the question then, I think, is that really for all of us now, what do we do on the 4th of July to change materially the position of the people in Scotland? And the first priority in that has to be getting rid of this Tory government. The way to do that is to vote Labour on the 4th of July to make sure that we can actually maximise our voice in Westminster. So instead of sending a message to London, you send a government. You have people at the heart of that that can actually deliver for the priorities of the people of Scotland. So for this point, this moment in time, I would ask people to go on that journey together so that we can actually try and change the circumstances of people in Scotland. Right, uh, man in the white jacket first, and then we'll go to the back. Yes. If pro-independence parties did win a majority of seats and a majority of votes, would Keir Starmer give a Section 30 order to Scotland? So, I, I, Keir Starmer said that there won't be a referendum, and he's not, he's not in favour of that. Is and that think, democratic? It's so, so, well, it's, well the, question, the question was about Keir Starmer, I'm afraid. That was the question I was asked, Richard. So, and, but I tell you, so there's a big debate, I think, about what is a mandate in this regard. So support for independence, you still will not give them a Section 30 order? So, I, I, no, there won't be a Section 30 order that won't, won't be approved. So it's undemocratic? I, I, well, I, yep. if, I, if, I can say to you, if I can say to you at the moment, I think that what, when I'm out speaking to people, actually the relevance of this issue to many people at the moment is very, very low, I have to say, and it's at nowhere level. I understand there are people who are really passionate about it. I understand that. You My know, question what, was what, if it's voted for, though, not how it's feeling now, if it's voted for in the future. Question. I think I've answered that question. You know, th there will not be a Section 30 order it's not we believe in the priorities of uh, the people of Scotland and that's certainly not what we're hearing but there is a question in this if I can uh, Stephen about mandates and we've heard from the uh, from the, uh, uh, John Swinney today when he was launching the manifesto that he was saying that there was um, some kind of formulation if we have um, the most number of seats even though it's not a, might not be a majority of the people that that will be a mandate and if that isn't delivered he still believes that there will be a mandate and a re legitimate question is asked on the other side that how can somebody express that they don't want a referendum to the SNP. On the SNP's terms, that's impossible. All right, you can't actually Richard tell them no. Th Richard Thompson. <laughs> well, I think the point that Michael misses quite spectacularly here is it's not about Keir Starmer, it's not about Michael. It's not, even a, asked, it's not even about me. It's about the people of Scotland and whether or not they have the right to become independent should they wish. Now, my, certainly my understanding of the union, I think most people in Scotland's understanding of the union, is that it's a union based on consent. So far, we haven't voted to take ourselves out of that. We had a chance in 2014, we chose not to. But if the people of Scotland have changed their mind, as they show every sign of moving to a position of that, then how can they withdraw their consent? And what Michael is saying, because he personally doesn't want it, his party doesn't want it, because he's already decided for you it's not a priority, that we can't ever have that say. But what now, about if you, if you very, set the target, Richard, if, uh, of a majority of the seats, and your, your <clears> number of seats is actually declining, if that happens, what does that say well, to you? The, traditionally, the this measurement of success in an election is uh, who, which party wins the most seats. So that would allow us to open negotiations and give us the right to expect negotiations. But if you don't... To, oh, let me finish. On how to give effect to that. Now, I, would, I think the question of independence is one of the most fundamental, because it gets to the most fundamental question in politics, which is about who decides. Who decides about resources? Who decides about taxation? Who decides about policy? 
And right now in Scotland, we have control over some things, but ultimately the resources are still controlled in large part from elsewhere by a wider electorate across the UK. I think the best people to govern Scotland are those, wherever they've come from, who have chosen to make their lives okay, here. Okay. And I would, just to finish uh, the point, no, I would... Just briefly, I would, you've had a lot of time I would, here. I would, like to, I would like us to spend less time obsessing about the how we get to independence and more time talking about the why of independence and why it's necessary. Because well, every we'll single issue we talk about about NHS cost of living, that question of who decides runs right through sure. the middle. We'll be doing that again in two years' time, I'm sure. Man in the pink at the back. Uh, well, the polls apparently show that Labour are going to do quite well in Scotland. Uh, so what that would mean, if it turns out to be true, is that you're going to have a lot of independent supporters perhaps lending their vote to Labour. Are you really telling them that you're going to deny them their democracy? And actually, that goes for the rest of the panel. How many of you are democracy deniers? Andrew Bow? Uh, far from it. Um, I know, make no bones about it. I'm a Conservative and a Unionist. Uh, I campaigned for Scotland to remain in the United Kingdom in 2014. I would do so if there was another referendum. I believe Scotland's place is best uh, served as a part of the, the wider uh, United Kingdom. I'm equally proud to be Scottish and British and will always uh, remain Answer so. Answer his point. Um, Are but you in terms denying of, democracy? No, I, I, respect, I respect the result of the 2014 referendum on Scottish independence in the same vein that I respect the I, I, 2016 referendum on... The hang on a second. ...of this country and of your constituency. Sorry, just say that again. We missed that there. Oh, what I'm saying is it doesn't really matter what Andrew Bowie's opinion on independence is. He is supposed to be a representative of the people. If the people want a referendum, they should have one. And to say no is to deny democracy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well... People should be under no illusions that if in the forthcoming election, if they vote for a Scottish Conservative Unionist candidate, they're voting uh, for there not to be another referendum on Scottish independence, and that they would be voting for candidates that would represent them in the Westminster Parliament that would campaign to keep Scotland uh, in the United Kingdom. But in terms of being a democracy denier, I respect the result of the 2014 referendum where Scotland voted to remain in the United Kingdom. In the same way that having campaigned to remain, I respect the result of the 2016 referendum uh, to leave the European Union. I think it's very important that we have these questions asked and we respect the results and then we move on and build from that and that is what we've done in Scotland that's what we're doing across the United Kingdom. Uh, lady in the blue top on the front row. You say in the 2014 election you respect that result. We were told by David Cameron that if we voted to remain in the UK mm. we would stay in the EU. He then introduced the Brexit referendum. Brexit has been a disaster. Why should we listen to anything you say? Let me get another audience member yeah. first. Lady in the black. Um, yeah, so just in respect to what you just said, don't vote Conservative, that would be the answer. <laughs> don't believe anything David Cameron says. Um, the second thing is we're talking a lot about um, people having the right to have the decision. In my eyes, we had that question was asked. That was quite right. Do you want Scotland to go an independent country? We voted no, OK? If I was to wake up on the 5th of July and there's be a you know, a government that I didn't believe in, do I then have a mandate to go, I want another election because I don't agree with what was decided? Like, how, how long until it's like, I don't agree? Also, also, I'd make the point that those who believe in one particular thing, such as independence, when you go down to the pub and you chat to your friends, of course you're going to talk about independence, but really, let's be honest, how many people, how many voters in Scotland is that the most important thing? We've talked about many things tonight, and I think if you asked actual voters what's important to them, how far is independence up that list? OK, OK, uh, Andrew, I... Yes, just to come back, yes, because on that the question point, was on yeah, David Cameron and the that. referendum. So David Cameron announced there would be a referendum on the UK's membership of the EU in January 2013. Scotland voted to remain in the United Kingdom in September 2014. There was always going to be a referendum on the United Kingdom's membership of the EU uh, come... Uh, a Conservative majority at Westminster, and that was what was delivered in the 2015 election. So it was not the case. ...in the UK, it was our only way of staying in the EU. Well, but, but he had already announced it before that there would the be a referendum. That is so there what would, he the said. You are the British obfuscating. People. Okay, <laughs> all right, all right. Well, I don't think you're going to come to an agreement on that. <laughs> w Willie Rennie, are you a, uh, a democracy denier as that man at the back of the, no, I, the room? Not, I mean, I, I support... You don't want another independence referendum. Okay. If I can have a word. Um, in 2014, we supported having the referendum at that stage. It was probably the biggest democratic experience this country has ever had, and we decided what we were doing. I think it's reasonable for us to focus on all the other people who are desperate just now to get a home, to get their NHS waiting list down, to be able to see a GP, to see a dentist, 
to make sure they can cut their energy bills. I think we've got a right to focus on those people because the last 10 years and more has been bedeviled, dragged down by the extremes of this debate. We need to focus, put our energy into changing the country because we have decided. I know you don't agree with the result from 2014. I know a lot of things have changed. A lot of things I would argue both ways have changed because I would think Brexit makes the case for not having independence. I think it, uh, the argument is there. Of course it's there and people can see both sides of it. But we are desperate to solve the social problems in this country and we need to stop revisiting this constantly and try and put more of our energy into well, solving well, well, the problems tell, in tell this country. Tell that to country. Kenny McCaskill as well. He's sitting right next to you there. It's, it's yeah. time to stop revisiting this, Willie Rennie says. Well, I think what people have to understand, I think Sophie's right, many people have many issues in their mind more than independence. But what we have to remember is that when the only change that comes on the 5th of July is that Tory austerity and war becomes Labour war and austerity, then we have to ask, what does Scotland do then? When we again get a government that, you know, uh, is implementing policies so that we do not like. Just the fact of the matter is, actually the Liberal Dems support it, but it was a Labour government under Tony Blair that brought in the Good Friday Agreement and where the island of, the island of Ireland is entitled to a border poll every seven years. Why is it that Keir Starmer is prepared to allow a border poll in Northern Ireland on unification, but won't consider the democratic right of the Scottish can, people to have a country that can, can look after its people and it, not see its it, energy it, wealth with oil and gas or renewable you, energy right. stolen from it? Can, can you, if, you put, if you put as much of that passion, and it's good passion, into trying to drive down waiting lists, we might have fewer people in our constituencies who are wincing every day because they can't get a hip operation, or they've got pain in their mouth because they can't get a dentistry. If you put as much energy into that, we might make a bit more well, progress. Right. In this Man in the beard like, on the end of the road. You are just obsessed about independence. In yes, on you go. Yeah, I think the SNP in Alba are just as bad. Everything is blamed on Westminster. But you have got the powers for the NHS, education, drugs desk, the attainment gap, all of these things are things that are failing in Scotland right now that you could change. Why on earth should we believe that if we're independent, these will magically be made better? Because they won't under you. Yeah. <laughs> Richard Thompson? Yeah, look, you're right that any Scottish government has power over some policies, but the resource envelope is determined in very large part by decisions that are taken in another parliament entirely. And that is how the Barnett formula works. It's just simply a fact. Look, what I find depressing about this is, is the idea that there's a binary that you can either talk about independence or you can talk about all it's these all other really important is issues is when the question of who decides goes right through it. And if I could just try and find maybe one point of unity, maybe a bit naively here, we don't have to agree on independence. But surely we can agree that democracy is not a one-time event and that people have a right to change their mind and that if they do, there has to be a mechanism by which that can be given right. effect. That, that takes us quite nicely, actually, to our final question of the night here tonight. And we've only got about five minutes for this, but I want to try and squeeze this one in. And it comes from Maddock Ferguson. Maddock, where are you? How will you all increase voter turnout amongst young people who feel left behind by today's politics? Thank you very much. An Electoral Commission report 2022 said a third of 20 to 24 year olds were not registered to vote. Registration closed, of course, last night at midnight. Um, Richard Thompson. I think that's an absolutely <laughs> frightening statistic. And the, the one thing I would say, whenever I meet uh, somebody, whether they're young or not quite so young, who says they're not interested in politics, I always say, well, look, politics is certainly interested in you. It determines your life chances. Again, as I said in answer to the previous question, it's about who decides and, you know, who decides what your opportunities are, what they might be, whether you can go and live, work, love in other countries as we used to have when we were in the European Union. And if you don't have... If you don't participate in that system, then it will be other people who are taking those decisions on your behalf. So uh, it's very, very difficult to, to reach groups. But I try to approach them with an optimistic message, but above all, with that note of realism, that even if you're not interested in politics, it's certainly interested in you, and you need to start voting in what's the interests of you, your family, your community, and actually play a part as an active, engaged citizen. Michael Mara, how do we get young people involved in politics engaged? Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's a question of 
shoe leather and going out and having those conversations with people because I was speaking to colleagues before we came on stage everyone's working as hard as they can to speak to as many people as they can I think the question in this is about the shape of our politics and the issues and for too long I think younger people have been neglecting our political debate then actually in fact we've got fallen outcomes in our schools we've got um, a decline in standards in terms of performance in our universities we seem to be more obsessed about protecting the other end of the age spectrum on every single uh, policy. If you, if, you, if you listen to the Tories across the UK, you'd think that only people over the age of 85 voted at all. You know, that's been their pitch for the last okay. three weeks. So we need to make sure that we shift that debate. We talk about opportunity, we talk about education, and we talk about the future in a positive way. Okay, Andrew Bowie. Yeah, look, one of the best jobs I've had since I got into politics was uh, a vice chairman for youth within the Conservative Party. And through that, I engaged with uh, young people up and down the UK, not just of a Conservative persuasion, but actually of all persuasions. And I'm always bowled over by the enthusiasm, the ideas and the, and, and the determination to change things. Not, 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 not especially and always in the way that I would like to see things change, but in the, view, in the passion that they bring uh, to that debate. But I think it's a wider issue here. There is a whole generation. This generation we're talking about is the same generation that was most affected by schools closing, closing down as a result of COVID, that saw their life chances closed down, that were prevented from going out, socialising, dating. And I think they, they, they feel completely ignored by society. So we have to have a wider debate as to how we engage with a generation that feels that society has let them down right, only and that they do not left. have a stake in it. I think that's a really Will, important thing we need Willie to get, Rennie. get doing. So of course we've got a responsibility and sometimes we fail. Sometimes we talk a language that nobody else talks. We don't really answer questions. Of course that's the case. But young people have got a responsibility as well because if they don't vote and they don't make their views known, don't be surprised when the political system ignores them. It's important that they stand up and realise that this democratic system is as much for them as it is for anybody else. And when they do vote, it makes a difference. There is a shift in manifestos. You can see, I've seen it in previous elections where young people rise up and vote. And we need to get that message across that this is in much your responsibility to vote okay. as it is to try and appeal okay. to people to come. Thanks. It's not we're, 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 we're out of time, Willie. Kenny McCaskill, finally. Well, young people are interested in politics. I've marched at uh, Climate 26 and COP26. I've been at demonstrations in Palestine. But they're when not they, registering when, to vote. When, yeah, when the average age was significantly younger than myself. It was in the teens, if not into the 20s and 30s. The problem is not with young people. The problem is with political parties. They are disengaged from them. So I think each political party requires to look to it. My own party has uh, things to do that we have to do better. But we should not be suggesting that young people are disengaged. They're disengaged with political parties. They're certainly worried about the world in which they live and the wrongs are being perpetrated in their name. OK, thank you very much. We're out of time this evening, I'm afraid. Hands up in the audience. Uh, that's it for tonight. We'll be back next week. We're going to be in Portobello in Edinburgh for our final programme before the general election. And then the week after the election, we're going to be in Mary Hill in Glasgow. If you want to come along, be part of the audience. Full details are on our website, bbc.co.uk forward slash debate night. The BBC website also the place to go for a full list of candidates standing in constituencies in this general election if you missed any of tonight's show we're repeated a bit later on bbc one scotland or you can catch it any time that suits you on the bbc iplayer thank you very much indeed to my panel here tonight and to our audience in aberdeen and to you at home for watching we'll see you next week in edinburgh in the meantime stay safe stay well from all of us in debate night good night mm -hmm.